You know, it might be fair to say that there is great trepidation and great hope ahead of the election in the Democratic Republic of Congo. It's a country that's never experienced a peaceful transition of power since independence from Belgium in 1960. The current president, Joseph Kabila, has clung on to power since the end of his second term two years ago. But next week, his delaying tactics should finally come to an end. Very good to have your company You're watching Roundtable with me, David Foster. The United States is currently pulling non-essential diplomatic staff out of the DRC and several other embassies are expressing their concern. One fear is that in such a vast country plagued by electricity blackouts and using electronic voting for the first time, it's going to be hard to believe that this vote is in any way legitimate. The Democratic Republic of Congo's president took power in 2001 after his father was assassinated. Joseph Kabila went on to win two more terms, but the constitution bans him from running for a third. And he's already stayed on past his mandate after two election delays. Instead, Kabila's right-hand man, Emmanuel Shadari, will contest the vote. The former interior minister has been blacklisted by the European Union. At least 20 other candidates are also on the ballot. Several opposition parties are lining up behind Martin Fayulu, a respected businessman and politician. It is a daunting logistical challenge with 40 million people registered to vote and elections not just for the president, but also local and parliamentary ones too, using brand new voting machines. Many are skeptical the vote won't be legitimate, and there's widespread fear of election violence. Well, I'm very pleased to say that we welcome from Belgium, Kern Vlassenroot from the Department of Conflict and Development Studies at Ghent University. With me at the round table, Francine McGuire, a Congolese human rights activist. Also here, Winston Mano, director of the African Media Center at the University of Westminster, and Okito Tongomo, president of the Congolese in exile. Great to have you with us here. Let's start with the two of you, because you are from DRC. This is a country that has major problems. 161st out of 180 in terms of corruption, 176th out of 188 in terms of human development. And yet the World Bank says it could be one of Africa's wealthiest countries. What potential does the DRC have and what's holding it back? Thank you very much, David. I really appreciate to have this question because this is something we have to know. Congo's got a lot to offer in our society. This is a one top country where we got all different type of natural resources. Having said that, I can add something more specific. Today we got the new generation of emerging technology. The use of electronic car and the different equipment we're going to use in our society. The use of mobile phone. Congo will get more than 70% of the world cobalt. Cobalt? Cobalt um, something else called coltan? Coltan, cobalt, uranium, they're all based in the Congo. So I can speak now the only country in the globe that is ready to, to offer in our society. In a coming society where you're going to have a much better emission and a much better environment where people could live much longer, Congo is in a top society. So where's it going wrong? I can go that? through on that one. What is going on is mismanagement on the country. We got a generation of a criminal regime since the Congo had independence in 1960. And it, this should be the first peaceful transitional power we're going to have in the Congo. We have to see only cool people being killed during transitional power. And that this is a country where should offer a lot to the rest of the globe. We have to look at this as an international issue to see the stability of Congo that will change the globe. There are two likely winners of this election, even though there are many other candidates. There's Martin Fayulu. Yep, a businessman associated with the former warlord Jean-Pierre Bemba, who's come out of prison in The Hague, gone back to Congo. He had been convicted of war crimes. There's um, Emmanuel Chadri, condemned for human rights abuses by the European Union. Mm -hmm. What sort of choices are they in terms of the human rights position? It is a really difficult choice, but when I look at, as a Congolese, because Congo, I need to mention, apart from the mineral or uh, my 
but they just stay. We, we have a human capacity because Congo is a young country, the mid, medium age is uh, six, uh, what, 17. So when I look at how many Congolese, specifically the youth, they, they, they really want change. If we have to vote with the name you, you, you stated, I can see the only person if we have to vote is Mate Fayulu because if you choose Sashada, this is the one associated with Jean Pierre Bemba. Yeah, but yep. that's at least not the official, if you like. Yeah, but the opposition. Yeah, the opposition because if you choose uh, Shadari, it's like the continuity of Kabila regime. We'll get on to, if we may, in a moment, um, what influence Kabila may have behind the scenes. But let's talk about the conflict that has been going on. Uh, can let me bring you in on this one. Um, Jan Egeland from the Norwegian Refugee Council saying that there are major problems in the east of the country, the borders with Uganda, Rwanda and Burundi, I believe, that he's seen troop escalations in that area and that these troops are pretty loyal to Kabila and by extension the candidate that he wants in this election. Well, the situation in Eastern Congo is, is, is rather complex, as we all know, and it's been going on for many years. Um, latest calculations say that there's about 140 different armed groups operating. Now, let's face it, these are very small groups in many cases. But what we see is that there are alliances coming up between these groups and also presidential candidates. And, and we should not forget, it's not only about electing a president, but also about electing 500 members of parliament and more than 700 members of provincial parliaments. So there's a lot of struggle going on also in the East. It's true that um, there are some shifts in, in armed, uh, armed deployments, but there's also the impact of the Burundian conflict, a number of opposition groups from Burundi operating from Congolese uh, soil, um, incursions from the Burundian army, um, Rwanda looking at, at it very closely, tensions growing between Rwanda and, uh, and Burundi. So Eastern Congo is a very volatile um, context already. Given the elections, of course, uh, everyone needs to position him or herself in all these different struggles, which makes it even more complicated to, to understand uh, without saying finding solutions to this, this immense security threat in the East. Yeah, Dennis McQuaggy, who, who won the Nobel Peace Prize jointly um, this year, said, what I've seen as I was leaving my country did not reassure me. There's very little electrical, electoral preparation, a lot of military preparation. It doesn't bode well, does it, Winston? No, it doesn't. Uh, I, I think to some extent, you know, the rich mineral resources that the Congo have uh, have actually, you know, attracted a lot of uh, undesirable, you know, uh, actors. You have uh, a lot of uh, locals who are very greedy, using political and economic power to uh, amass wealth for themselves and to do everything at these crucial moments like elections to try and protect their interests. And we also have international actors who come behind, you know, via proxy, who come behind these actors. And the Congo, unfortunately, becomes a theater for, you know, conflict. Are we talking about African proxy actors or are we talking about international players? Because the Chinese have had big involvement in, in large parts. Of I, I, I'm talking Africa. about both, David. You have, you know, uh, uh, different international actors, you know, from some, some who are after these minerals that you are talking about for mobile phones, cut out, cop out, and they want to secure a supply, and they would back their candidates, but they are not doing it via the front door, they are doing it via the back door. And unfortunately, this has fueled the conflict. And what we need to do is to try to uh, get to the bottom of this. And at this time of election, it's a great opportunity to try and you know, refresh the system. Uh, but unfortunately, <laughs> Uh, the preparations have not been, you know, very reassuring. We have seen uh, the delays for the past two years where, for some reason, Mr. Joseph Kabila has said the voters' role was not ready, the like, independent electoral commission has not acted very independently, and the preparations have been a bit chaotic. And like uh, what uh, Franzini is saying, the banning of uh, about two-thirds of the electronic uh, uh, voting machines, yeah. uh, just with less than a week to go, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a worrisome point, you know, how fair and independent are going to be these elections. And it's not even enough. They count, they count the size of Western Europe. They, that, those electronic machines, they need to go everywhere in Congo. They're not even enough in a, 
in the cities, villages, I don't know those who live in the villages, are, are they not Congolese? Are they not going to be able to vote? Or what are they going to do? The voting so, is on Sunday, yeah? Yeah. and they are today, uh, they are withdrawing the old machines and yeah. supplying new ones. So there's not much time, really, to... Okito, uh, I think you want to say something. I yeah, have, I have I a do. question, but please speak first. <laughs> yeah, I just really have to mention this because we have to have some clarity on this. We're talking about the use of electronic machine and the principal Kabila has a delayed election for the past two years. Let's be clear on this issue. Everybody around the globe knows that Mr. Kabila is not ready to organize a free and fair election in Congo. He's using delay technique. Since 2016, we see a man who has imposed a different strategy where Congolese are not going to have a free election. Let me give you a few examples. We're talking about the electronic machine and having some of my colleagues here accepting some candidate. I have to mention this. The Congolese people deserve much better than this. I can I just ask you this, this one? Yes, no, please, can I just ask you this question? Yeah. Um, on researching this, I was sort of minded to think about um, Dmitry Medvedev and Vladimir yeah. Putin. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> How one became president while the other one, and Mr. one Putin, yeah. decided to be prime minister for a yeah. couple of years. Yeah. And I'm wondering if this is what perhaps might be happening. If Emmanuel Chaudhry becomes the president, the current president, who said he would like to be an informal advisor, might be biding his time to come back in 2023. Well, let me say this. We... So he would effectively be running the show. There is no way we can avoid any strategy used by Kabila. For years, Kabila never responded to well. But do you think that's a possibility? But look, this is a man who never respect the value of the constitution. He can breach anything whenever he wants. As long as the international communities are observing, this is a person that to continue the regime of Kabila, we're going to witness again serious human rights abuse and the serious the country where people need to see stability in the future of the, around the globe. Kern, I heard you sort of make a, a sort of like an assent noise or a sort of an ironic grunt type of noise when, when I mentioned... <laughs> <laughs> Putin and Medvedev. Um, is this the way that it could be seen? Well, that's a, it's an analysis which is, is popping up everywhere. And indeed, there are, there are some similarities, but I think there's also differences. Um, we should make a distinction between the president and the regime. Um, we used to talk about Kabila regime, but there's a difference between himself um, as a president and a regime that wants to stay in, in power. I don't think um, a Putin scenario or Putin Medvedev scenario is very likely. Uh, we don't know when the next elections will be for, for the first uh, first place. But also, um, it it all depends on cohesion and stability within the regime. And there's several um, signs that this regime is much less stable, uh, much, uh, much less cohesive than we often assume. So I'm not sure how the future is going to look like. Um, and I don't think we can really predict what is going to come, when it's going to happen after Shadari, if in the case he would be elected. If, if, Francine, um, I just wanted to ask you in terms of human rights, since Dennis McQuaggy, who I, I mentioned here, mm -hmm. collected his prize, was announced as the Nobel laureate, um, have you seen any indication that things are improving? No, because we have a lot of activists. I have so many friends have been arrested. I mean, the Lucha, for instance. We have a lot of uh, uh, young activists in prison. Apart from that, we have a, a lot of politi politicians in prison every single day. Like two days ago, they arrested the Lucha's uh, activists. I, I agree with Francine that uh, when you're a leader, you need to communicate your intentions and need to you know, create the unity. And for a long time, I think Mr. Joseph Kabila has not been very communicative. He has uh, kept his cards to his chest. And even the election, you know, to, he didn't allow, you know, the announcement. The announcement was made in November, which is very, you know, which gives uh, the opposition very little time to campaign. And Congo is a vast country. And when they are trying to campaign to have the state forces, the police and the, you know, the soldiers, using live ammunition on supporters. It's very, very unfortunate. It should not be like that. Yeah. And the UN uh, human rights chief has already sounded you know, a warning that what is going on in the Congo is not, does not bode well for democracy. Why, why did democratization. Um, President Kabila, um, who came to power after his father was killed, and he said he would end corruption, that he would make the country more stable. Well, we've heard that from an awful lot of people. Now, he may have had the intention to do so. So my question is, a, 
Um, why did he fail to do so if he wanted to? Or secondly, was he never of that mind? Can I ask that yeah. one of okay. Yeah, yeah, please, David. That's a very good question. Let me just uh, clarify in a few issues relation to the human rights face, and I'll come back to that question. I think we have to look at the reality of a human rights in Congo. The serious breach of human rights in Congo has been historically permanent since Mr. Kabila in 2001. Kabila weaknesses is a number of issues. Because it could be relating to his personal management of the politic. This is somebody's background is quite very limited. He doesn't even understand what is going on in the Congo. There has been a number of reports. Some people call him the person without a clue. There has been never change in the Congo. His leadership has been one of the weakest in the world. So we have to speak here to speak the truth what is happening. Do you believe this that he not... was incapable or never wanted to, to write his country? Both. I can mention the most issue was his incapability due to his weakness, his weaknesses, and also his background. Kabila doesn't understand politics. He doesn't understand Congo. He can't rule the how, country. How, how do you stop what seems to be um, a systemic problem in a number of African countries, we won't just point at DRC here, of the people in power looting the system? Mobutu did it. Four, five, six billion, I think, I think it was. Yep. Um, Kabila, there, there is no figure on it at the moment. Well, we're talking about 15, 15 billion, billion already. OK. Yes. How do you stop that? How do you get the right person in, in the job? Because there's a cycle of violence, a cycle of oppression, um, limiting of free speech. The person who would perhaps be able to do it is not allowed to run or stand. How do you, do, how do you deal with that? I'll go through the answer. I will give you the answer in a second. Zero corruption. The justice have to apply. The enforcement of law, that's the vision we get from the diaspora. I was elected to lead the diaspora as a government in exile, and this is one of our plan. Congo deserves much better than that. The corruption has been in the center of the all impunity, the ongoing human rights abuse and the stability in the country. But because but you, the regime is incapable of... Okay, sorry, you you have assessment. been suggesting, and I don't think you've denied it, that you might like one day to be the president I'll be more than of, happy of, of the DRC. My country. Yeah. How do you get to run with the current system? Either Shadri or Fayulu as president, and you talk about corruption. I'm not pointing a finger directly at them, but you say, how do you get to run? Bro, we got both leaders we're talking now. None of them has been elected, and I don't see them being elected as the way the system going at the moment. We're probably going to have just another round table very soon to discuss how this election has been going. We're going to have some criminals ahead of the state again. So we want to see stability in Congo. We have to start planning for future stability on Congo. That's what my vision is about. That's what the diaspora are coming with. You yeah, have to start okay. thinking for stability in the features. I, I'm going to summarise here, and I think at yes, the moment you, you don't actually know how you could possibly get on a ballot <laughs> paper in the country you would like to, and you, you have a manifesto. Another form of break. You have a manifesto. But the law, but the law David, I have to clarify that we should be elected, we should be voting. The ballot paper should be here in the diaspora. But the government has refused. That's what we said. This election is not going to be credible. But let's, let's come back to the current, yeah, go on. Cu the current situation, if we may. Winston, I know you want to say something, yeah. but I want to go to Kern after that. And then... Okay. Bring you back in, Francine. I, I think it's a very it's very important to build institutions that last. It's not about individuals. Yeah. I think for the Congo's future, it's very important to create institutions that are the foundations for democracy, whereby people can participate without uh, any Fail. inhibition. Mm. And Might also, inhibition. if the diaspora wants to participate, but to get that but political who has will. No interest in including the diaspora is not going to start saying we should be including the diaspora. In other words, if this current system suits them, they're not going to really want to change it, are they? Uh, they, they, they should. I mean, uh, to be fair, you know, of course they pres should. President Joseph Kabila <laughs> has stabilized the Congo. You know, so where we are coming me? from, sorry, don't where say we are that coming from was very. There has been no, never stability. That, that, in Congo. But however, no, I, I really want you to rectify that statement. Yeah. I, I will, I will um, never let, let you have that. Let let we're finish. talking about Please over let 12 million people being killed since 2001. And then apart from that, no, can I just rectify that? No, Karen, because I'm here talking about. 12 million Congolese people being killed yes. because of this regime. I, I agree You're talking with about you, stability. But I'm There's stability on corruption, there's stability on calling, killing individual people, there's stability on breaching the law, there's stability on taking a country and hostage. There, there's, that's what you call okay, stability. So may, may I suggest, no, no, one second, please. No, please, please. May I suggest, no, I just get, want to clarify we are getting yeah. nowhere by hectoring one yeah, another please. in, I just in want this to make situation. Sure you is correct. Okay. So you say, can I qualify my There has been never been stability in Congo. We've been killed as a result. You were interrupted. Whoa, 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 please. Years of horror. Everybody okay. here. Yeah. 
Just stop talking for a second. Okay, I never want this programme to descend into a shouting match. Okay, thank okay. you. Okay, yeah. I understand you have a point, Akita, but yeah. please finish off what you say. Don't yes. interrupt this time, okay. please. In 2006, we had the elections. In 2011, we had the elections. The 10 year you know, uh, period has elapsed, and Mr. Kabila was holding on. Yeah? But nonetheless, the country had a lot of wars, a lot of conflicts. Yeah? He could have done better. There are things he could have done better. But we are seeing a semblance of, you know, uh, a country which is, I mean, the, for us to talk about elections is that they are, you know, by commission or omission, there is a, you know, a system that is there, but we want the system to work better. Francie, let me ask you about the, the likely winner of this, mm -hmm. Emmanuel Chaudhry, accused of human rights abuses by the European Union. Uh, Tell us what abuses he is accused of and, and what evidence there is for this and what, what should be done about it if he becomes president of the DRC. I mean, he played massive role in the destabilization of the central part of Congo, Kasai precisely. He played a massive role. We, when you look at the East, I mean, what happened in that part of the Congo is supposed to be something easy to sort it out, but he played massive role because he was an interior minister, if I am right. That's correct. And then he played massive role. Today we have uh, that region we used to be the peaceful region, but it's really uh, the region does... Our, our he directed yeah, human rights abuses or yeah, he allowed then, them to happen yeah, without he, interfering? No, no, he allowed it to happen because Kabila was imposing him, asking him what to do, what happened in Kasai. And then today in Kasai we have... Uh, uh, 84 mass graves, and then the killing of two UN experts happened also in Kasai. So he actually mm, played impo yeah, important, massive ro ro role in the okay. destabilization of that region. So, Kern, um, December the 23rd, the election, um, suggestions from various international bodies that things aren't going to get any easier um, after that because the results will probably be disputed one way or the other. So the real flashpoints are going to be where and why the potential for yeah well it's it's difficult to know where this country will move towards right um it's very likely that shadari will win the elections um, actually he doesn't need a majority of voters electoral law says that the the win the the one who has most votes is the winner so even with a score of 15 percent you can win the elections if the other ones have less uh, which creates a lot of maneuvering space, of course. On the other hand, I think um, Shadari needs to to build, if he wins, to to build his own power base little by little, which he doesn't have for the moment. So I'm not sure to which extent he will just be a puppet um, of the Kabila regime. I don't think so. On the other hand, there's also a need to align with parts of the opposition in order to... Um, to calm down um, and uh, there's uh, to calm down the the, the 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 tension, and there I think there's a, no, a number of potential scenarios happening. Some of the opposition might join forces with Shadai and uh, create a new government. I think that's the most likely scenario. Uh, but on the other hand, of course, there will be a lot of dispute of the voting results and um, looking at the volatility and the conduct of of, of armed groups and armed actors today it's very likely that we are entering a, a phase of, of, of high risk and high uncertainty um, after the 21st of December. Okay, so I will come to you to help yeah. you round up the programme because I want to ask you about your presidential ambitions. But, sure. but, but Winston, at this particular point, we, th there are so many areas of contention. Is not part of the problem that the opposition is, is so fragmented? We talk about the two main candidates yes. um, and that uh, Fayulu was sort of put forward as the favoured opposition candidate, but there are so many other candidates. If they'd all come together, if there was some kind of consensus, we wouldn't be where we are now. Yes, I, I think uh, it's, it's an election with 21 presidential candidates, and uh, Martin Fayuli represents uh, you know, the Lamuka coalition, um, which uh, has a chance, but if there was a broader coalition, say with Felix, uh, Felix uh, Chisekedi as part of it, uh, perhaps we could be talking of, you know, a broader kind yeah. of uh, so movement. So it's part of the problem. Uh, but, but, uh, but you are right, you know, the, the lack of unity yeah. amongst the opposition candidates is a concern. How do you bring the opposition together, as you would like to do, as you hope to be one day president of the Democratic it's Republic of Congo? Very exceptional work I'm doing at the moment. We really have to see the opposition together. I feel like people look at this as a, a small thing. So Congolese people have suffered a lot. The change of regime is inevitable. And the opposition have to learn from that. 
There's no way they're going to win an election if they'll be divided. And I have to use my part as a somebody who's got some political influence within the political in my country. Both leaders in opposition, I'm trying my best at the moment to make sure they're going to come to a common arrangement before the election. That's the only way we can win this election. Having Mr. Shadar, who's one of the weakest person at the moment, we see him everywhere he's going. Congolese don't want to see him. Having him as another president will create another long-term stability in the Congo. So for the, at least the next five years, it is not going to be straightforward. But right, that's another problem we're going to have. Yeah. And that is already planned by Mr. Kabila and his principle, especially the use of force and the different strategy. Opposition have to learn from that. Working together is the only solution. And I agree with Boston, and I agree also with my colleagues. At the moment, I don't see both leaders of opposition being uh, prominent people to see the solution or the future. Well, listen, the thank you very much indeed. It, it is a manifesto of sorts uh, for tomorrow or for five years down the line. You're very welcome to come back onto our programme any time you like and, look forward for and, and tell us how it's, how it's all going. Look forward for that look and forward. a come campaign for me next time. Oh, <laughs> we'll you. certainly report on it. Listen, thank you very much indeed. Kern, thank you for putting the, the conflict and the general position um, in DRC in, into some kind of con context and good luck, Francine, in working for the improvement in human rights in DRC. We thank you too. Thank you very much, David. Um, and thank you very much for watching. This has been Roundtable. You can catch up with this programme or indeed any of the others uh, that you may have missed uh, on Roundtable. Uh, that's on YouTube, Roundtable TRT World. From me, David Foster, from the team, thank you for watching. Goodbye for now. <laughs>